Live. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for your patience. Again, my name is Mike Fidei, class of 1989 here at the University of Houston. I'm the AVP for Alumni Relations. I graduated from the Hilton College of Hotel Restaurant Management, and I am your host this evening on our UH2U topic on Grad School 101. I want to introduce to you our panelists here this evening. Sarah Larson, the Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate School at the University of Houston, a professor of chemistry as well. She is focused on increasing graduate enrollment and promoting our fantastic graduate school to our graduate students and implementing professional development opportunities as well. She is also currently the chair of the Association of Texas Graduate Schools. Sarah, how are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you Great for joining to be here. us. Um, I told somebody a long time ago, you know, you're always coming up for the holiday and, and new party games. I don't know what the party game would be, but you're on mute should be one, right? Uh, I don't know what that is, but it should be one. Um, <clears throat> Susan Scarrow is the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies at the College, I can't say this fast, I should just say class, Susan, every time, because College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences is a tongue twister for me, but that's where Susan is located. She oversees the recruiting, admission, and student success in the college's 12 doctoral programs and 16 master's degrees. And for those of you who don't know, also the the uh, College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences has nearly half of the undergraduate population at the University of Houston is in class. 32,000 undergraduates and about 14,000 in that one college. So it's quite amazing uh, how many programs are inside of there. She is also, I don't need to tell her because she's a professor of political science and a former chair and graduate director of the political science department. Susan, how are you today? Fine, thanks. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So I know you ladies have some wonderful content for us as we go along tonight, but we, we do want to remind our viewers casual questions, right? This We want this to be a conversation, not so much a presentation. I know that Susan and Sarah have, have set themselves up to do exactly that as well. So I don't know if we tossed a coin because uh, my document says who wants to speak first, but I think maybe should I kick Sarah? I think I flipped the coin in the air and Sarah, you're going to go first. So you are up. Sure, thanks, Mike. It is great to be here, and uh, we're excited to tell you uh, a little bit about graduate school uh, at UH, the wide range of programs that we have, and, and some information about uh, how to apply to programs. Susan, did you want to say something before we get started as well? Let me just say that we want your questions, so let me repeat that. Uh, that's what we're here for, and we've got some slides, but don't let them, that stop you from asking questions. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so first, we thought we'd just start with uh, a little bit of why to go to graduate school. Why might you want to consider graduate school? What types of graduate programs do we have? Uh, something about cost and affordability, which is always a big, big question thinking about um, higher education. And then some tips for applying to our, our graduate programs. So first of all, thinking about why go, why go to graduate school? Well, uh, the Data shows that the educational level is on the rise. So 13% of the US population over the age of 25 has a master's, professional, or doctoral degree. And that's up from about 8% in 2008. So that's been uh, increasing. And uh, you know, your question might be then, why is that increasing? And uh, we can look at the reasons that people want to go to graduate school. So uh, certainly, or, or want to obtain a, a higher degree. And certainly part of that has to do with the workforce and that, that jobs are more and more uh, requiring higher uh, uh, degrees. And um, there's also been some data, some surveys on why, uh, what are the top reasons for wanting to attend graduate school? And you know, keep in mind the number one reason is passion or high interest in the particular area. You'll find that graduate programs tend to be much more specialized and focused than undergraduate programs, where typically an undergraduate degree program will have some aspect of, of some general education requirements or um, some breadth requirements. And while graduate school also has some, some options for electives and things like that, they generally tend to be more focused in a single subject area. Um, certainly there's interest um, for uh, higher paying jobs. And so advancement opportunities within, uh, within your career is often a big reason. And uh, preparation for many types of jobs. So as we know, 
uh, the workforce is changing. That's I think never never been more evident than than today. Now in the midst of the a pandemic, that we're learning new ways to do things uh, uh, to adjust. So these are these are some of the reasons and some of the considerations that you might think about uh, when considering whether you want to attend graduate school. The next thing I want to touch upon is is there's lots of different types of of graduate programs. So. Uh, you know, you, you might be familiar with a master's uh, and PhD, but there are also some variations of, of each of these degrees. So we have master's degrees, we have master's of science, we have master's of arts degrees. We have doctoral degrees, the PhD degree. We also have professional master's degrees. So the master of social work, the master of science and nursing, the master of business administration. And then in the, the final area, we have professional doctorates. So an EDD, a doctor of education, the medical doctor, uh, the pharmacist, uh, optometrist, and law. So that would be the MD, the PharmD, the OD, and the JD. So you'll also notice I have those um, highlighted in red. And the reason is uh, I just want to differentiate. We'll mainly talk today about uh, master's and PhD programs. And these, these professional doctoral programs in red um, have their own separate admissions processes. So certainly we can answer questions that you might have about that, but keep in mind that those will have a, a separate and different admissions process than many of the other programs we'll talk about today and admissions requirements. So within these degree programs, master's degree programs, we can have uh, coursework only programs. We can have coursework and capstone project or experience. Uh, and then certainly we can have coursework and a thesis or a dissertation, depending on whether it's a master's or a PhD program. And so uh, in thinking about what where your interests lie, you might also consider uh, what type of graduate program would, would best align with your um, with your interests and with your goals. We also have graduate certificates. So we, you're not, maybe not sure that you want to go to graduate school, um, maybe toying with the idea, thinking about it. Um, one option would be to look at a graduate certificate, which typically a graduate certificate ranges from three to seven uh, graduate courses in a particular area. Um, and you can determine, you know, whether whether that's an area that you're interested in pursuing further. Uh, some of these are standalone. Some of them um, can can be used to lead on to master's degrees. Um, the other thing to consider, we have online programs, we have in person or face to face programs, and we also have hybrid programs and by hybrid. Typically, that means that there is um, there are both components There are online components as well as some face to face component components of those courses. And then uh, the last uh, consideration in terms of types of graduate programs, the length of the program, these can range from one year uh, full time for a coursework masters uh, to four to six years for a PhD program. So there's a lot of, of variation. There's also you know, options of whether you wanna go full time or part time. There are sometimes uh, part time programs as well. So lots of, um, lots of different opportunities and options to think about. Um, at the University of Houston, we have over 150 master's, doctoral, and professional degree programs. Uh, we have a number of these programs that are ranked in the U.S. News and World Report. Uh, in the top 50, for example, we have a, a social work program, we have a master, online masters of education programs, and, and several engineering programs that are very, very highly ranked. Um, as you know, since many of you or most all of you are alumni, um, we have the most diverse public university in the US. Um, about 30% of our graduate students are international, so we really have uh, a very, very diverse domestic and international graduate student body. We have over 30 completely online graduate degree programs. So um, if that's something that you are interested in or you feel that you learn, you learn well, in the online environment and you like the convenience of the online environment, we have a number of options there as well. And then um, the last uh, point I wanted to make is we are we're a tier one research institution. And what that means is that we have a full range of, of programs where you can participate either at the doctoral level or the master's level uh, and engage in research, cutting edge research with faculty on our campus. So if I think about the 
broad range of programs. Um, I just have a list here and it's a little bit overwhelming, but these are each of the colleges ranging from architecture, arts, business, education, engineering, hotel and restaurant management, uh, law, liberal arts and social sciences, natural science and mathematics, nursing, optometry, pharmacy, public affairs, social work and technology. And then I, I need to add one more square there. We have our newest college of medicine as well. Um, I would encourage you to look at the um, full list of graduate programs. Um, I have a link here and I'll put it in the chat in just a, a couple of minutes. Um, so you can take a look at um, the full range of programs that we have. We also on our webpage listing all of the programs we have contacts so you can reach out to an advisor if you want to learn more or you have some questions about the, the curriculum, the length of the program or uh, uh, any other questions related to uh, the program, the finances, financial aid available, things like that. And then just just to to point out um, some of our some of our main considerations in our UH graduate programs, student success. We're very committed uh, to supporting our graduate students uh, throughout their time. Uh, in our programs. One of, one of the uh, efforts that I've particularly been working on in my uh, two, two and a half years here so far have, has been professional development for graduate students and protect, per, um, expanding the opportunities that students have um, to get some uh, outside help um, related to either their research or their, their career search or career development. Um, and also providing opportunities for students to share their research and uh, things like that. Um, there's also an opportunity to engage with, as I mentioned before, research and also with our top faculty. Um, looking at the news, we've had a number of faculty uh, and students involved in research related to COVID-19, whether that's codings for developing codings for surfaces or, or working in the area of uh, vaccine development. Uh, and then lastly, we have um, a number of opportunities for global uh, and local engagement. So it's very important to us um, as a, a university in Houston to really engage with the Houston community as well as the global community. And then I just wanted to highlight um, some of our new graduate programs. So as I mentioned, we have 150, so I'm not going to go through all of those graduate programs, but some of our newest programs that started up in the last five years include a Master's of Science in Engineering Data Science, that's a uh, program in the College of Engineering, a Master of Science in Business Analytics, uh, and also one in management and leadership. The business analytics and uh, management and leadership are both in the College of Business. The management and leadership degree is an online degree. Uh, in natural science and mathematics, we have the Master of Science in Statistics and Data Science. We have a relatively new Master of Science in Pharmacy Leadership and Management. There's also a Global Hospitality Management Master of Science degree. As well as I added this one, it's not a new degree, the Master of Science in Biology, but um, they recently re revised the program to include a graduate certificate in biomedical science. So really trying to link to the biotechnology community um, here in Houston. And then um, in doctoral programs, we have a PhD in, in petroleum engineering, uh, a new PhD in the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences in Communication Sciences and Disorders, as well as the inaugural class in the College of Medicine started in July. So that was very, uh, very exciting for us. So these are just a few, just a sample to show you um, areas where I think there's, there's particular opportunity um, uh, in, in terms of higher ed and, and building your, your skills. So now I wanna, um, I'll, I'll stop for a minute and uh, see if there are any questions and then I'm gonna hand it over to Susan to tell you a little bit about uh, some, some of the factors to consider when thinking about a graduate program. Uh, are there any questions we should answer now, Mike, or should we keep no, going? There aren't, any, there aren't any in the chat just yet. It only takes okay. one person to ask their first question and the Pandora's box opens and then we can't keep up, but it'll happen. Uh, okay. So I would suggest maybe Susan go ahead. I mean, I have a couple questions here that that uh, that I've that I've come prepared with generally. But well, why don't we let Susan go ahead and and I know there's folks out there uh, who are going to ask a question any moment. So why don't we do that and then we'll come back to the questions. Okay, okay. perfect. 
Okay, thanks. Well, Sarah's laid out this whole forest of programs and all these opportunities, and you've probably thought of some. And of course, we're not the only game in town, so you may think of other places, shame on you, but, but there are other places that maybe uh, that you're thinking. And so what do you think about when you try to consider a grad program? And some of the factors, you need to think about what's going to work for you. Uh, because m most people take these degrees, although they are driven by passion, they're also thinking about what, how this is going to work with their career. They're thinking about the other things they have to do with their life. Uh, so how long does it take? Is it a full-time or part-time program? Some programs are very accommodating of part-time. Some of them are offering all their courses in the evening. Some of them expect you to be a full-time student. How much does it cost? And we're gonna, I'm going to get back to that because that's a big one, but, but you have to look at that. Um, what's the mode of instruction? Is it solely face-to-face? -face? Is there some online? Is there hybrid? And what works for you? You may, we've all had to, uh, teaching now, we've been doing a lot more online teaching. We're maybe getting better at it and more used to it and, and think that's nice, but face-to-face -face is good too. And so you know what's good for you. Um, what about the requirements of the program? For instance, is there an internship? Is that built into it? And that's something you really want to do? Or is there, um, how much, how many hours are required for the coursework? Uh, some master's degrees are 30 hours, some are 36 or more. How's that going to work for you? So look at exactly what they are because it can be called the same degree, but if you look uh, at different uh, institutions, they may offer different things, even within the same institution to get a master's degree isn't always the same thing. So over and over again, over and over again, we say, uh, look at the web page. Programs web pages are your, are your friend. All right, the next, next slide. Aha, the important one, how are you gonna pay for this? The good news is that there's some ways to help with grad school. Uh, we, at the University of Houston, we have the Graduate School Fund, which is need-based aid uh, for Texas residents. You have to submit your, your FAFSA, your financial aid form, uh, but many people who do qualify. It's a great program. I'll show you some details uh, later exactly how that works. Uh, we also have graduate tuition fellowships and assistantships. There are merit-based scholarships and financial aid. Um, so you can learn more about this on the graduate school page. But let me again say, you've got to go look at the web page and you've got to see the details. So the next slide, please. Um, one of the things you're going to see if you look at the web page, you're going to say, Oh, graduate tuition usually costs more than undergraduate tuition. Uh, and that's true. Um, but it's also often true that graduate students take fewer credit hours per semester than undergraduates. So a full load for a doctoral student might be nine hours um, rather than 12 hours for an undergraduate. So even if the credit hours cost more, it might not cost more per semester. Even better, in many doctoral programs, or most doctoral programs, and some of the master's programs, students work as teaching assistants, and the teaching assistants are paid. They're not doing that just for free. They're getting paid, and they're getting, uh, usually they're getting a tuition scholarship. So if you're thinking about doctoral studies, you can get paid to study. I mean, that's, the, that's a big secret that people may not have told you. Let me tell you another secret while we're at it, I'm telling secrets. Uh, if you're thinking about a doctoral program, you may or may not need to get a master's degree first. It, many people think it's a ladder of education, so you always have to get your master's first and then your doctorate. Uh, programs differ. Some let people in with just the undergraduate degree and you earn your master's degree along the way. So you wanna, again, this is when you're going to be looking at the websites, you're going to be contacting that advisor and finding out exactly how it would work for you in your preferred program. 
But if you're lucky, you can get the master's degree and the doctoral degree in five years with someone else paying you to do it. And that's the optimal uh, in some programs. Okay, next slide. So if I haven't convinced you yet, let me give you an example here uh, from class and just say tuition varies in, in every program. So this is just a kind of hypothetical, but gives you some idea of what it would cost to be a full-time um, master's student. Uh, if you're taking nine hours, uh, it costs a little over $4,000. If you get one of those, the graduate school fund uh, fellowships, uh, you can be getting uh, those are up to $5,000 a year, so you can get $2,500 for a semester. And say your department likes you a lot and gives you a $1,000 annual merit scholarship, which many departments have them. So that gets you down to your cost per semester is $1,194. Well, divide that by the month, um, it starts to look a little more affordable. Um, it's, not, it's not daunting. Um, UH, the, the PhD in the class, again, you, you get that TA ship, which gives you a tuition fellowship. So your tuition is free. And then you're going to be earning maybe $7,500. Now it's not a lot of money, but you're not paying, they're paying you. Um, so sometimes graduate school is much more affordable than people think. Once you really start looking into what is it going to cost? Uh, and um, so I really urge you to look into it and take it seriously. Don't rule out that you could never go to graduate school because it's too expensive. There really are some ways that help people go to graduate school. Okay, next slide. Another reason that a lot of people get scared about going to graduate school is they have to take another test. They have to take the GRE or the GMAT. Um, and who wants to take another test? Well, the good news for you this year, if you're thinking about it, is many programs have waived the GRE or the GMAT due to COVID. So uh, if you are thinking about graduate school this year, check to see if they are requiring any kind of test. Um, send them an email. Hopefully they have it on their web page, but you never know. Um, web pages aren't always updated. So just contact them directly and say, hey, do I need this? Um, and if you're lucky, uh, you don't have to take it. Although if you've already taken it, um, then maybe you want to do it. You want to, some, some will let you optionally put in your scores because they might help you. Um, okay, next, next slide. Also, we've got more good news for you. Um, there are some waivers of the GRE and GMAT requirements for uh, UH undergraduates and alumni who have graduated within three years preceding the term for which they're applying. Uh, generally, you need a 3.3 GPA. Some, are, some say 3.2, so again, check uh, exactly what it is. But if you had a pretty good grade point average as, a, as an undergraduate and you're a recent grad, you can also get out of having to take this test. So yet more good news here. All right. So you're thinking of applying, you, we've got you convinced, you're about ready to go online and you're trying to get your materials together. What do you need? You need a personal statement. You're gonna need a resume or a CV, curriculum vita. You're gonna need transcripts you will need two to three letters of recommendation. Now, usually those come from professors, if it, especially if it's a more academic program, if it's more experiential program, or you've been out for a long time, it could be professionals, um, the, uh, you know, not your friends, not your family, uh, but people who know you and know the skills that are pertinent to the degree you want to take. So if the, if the degree is management, it may have to do with your management experience, but if the degree has to do with research, you want a professor or someone who can talk about your research skills. Again, you're gonna need test scores. Uh, and if you're an international student uh, who hasn't taken an undergraduate degree in the US, you'll need uh, uh, English proficiency scores. But I think we're talking to alumni, so th that probably doesn't apply to anybody here. 
Okay, so personal statement. Let me just say a little bit about this because we always get questions about what makes for a good application. And the personal statement or the statement of purpose uh, is another term for these and I think it's probably a better term. Um, it's a forward-looking statement. It's your chance to convince the people on the admissions committee that you're a good fit for them. That, so you're saying, how is your program going to help me realize my professional or my research aspirations? Programs have many applicants and they may be all equally qualified, but if you have to choose, you want the, you want the students you think you can help. You can help them realize their goals. So if you want to come study something that my department doesn't teach, you may be great, but we'll probably think that you should study somewhere else. So you're, this is when you're presenting yourself, you're presenting yourself in the context of that program. That program is good for me. Uh, so, and I would say, write a good statement, edit it. Make sure it's make sure it's polished. It is your place to shine. It is the personal part of these these uh, applications. Application fees. Oh, here's some even more good news. Um, it does cost to apply, um, but for domestic students who are attending tonight's uh, seminar, do we have a deal for you? Um, thanks to Dean Larson and the Graduate School, uh, there is a, a application fee waiver available to those of you attending tonight. And I think that's going to, the details on how to get that are going to be put in the chat. Is that right, Mike? I believe that is correct. I think uh, yep, I will, we have that information. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Yep. Thank you. So, so look in there to find out how to get, um, how to get this. Uh, Dean Larson, we have a question. How long is the application waiver valid? It's good for a year. Good for a year. So basically, if you're applying for fall 2021, that would be, or for, uh, I guess, through spring, spring 22. Str yep. Through spring 22. Okay, next slide. So how do you, how do you apply? Well, Big thing is there's an online application, which you find through the graduate school. Uh, start your online application, get that finished. One of, the, one of the steps is to, before it will be submitted, you have to pay your fee or apply the waiver. Um, then you have to have your transcripts and the test scores. Uh, those, are, those are super important so that you can be admitted uh, and any additional materials uh, you add to that. Uh, when do you do this? Um, each program has a different deadline. Um, I keep going back to this. They all have different deadlines, but many of them, if you're thinking of fall 21 uh, admissions, many of them are going to be coming up real soon. Uh, a few of them in December, many more of them in January and February. And then some of the master's programs will have deadlines going through June, uh, but you, know, you don't have to wait till the last minute. And some of them, if they, especially if you want the financial aid, uh, you can, um, you can uh, apply now, get admitted, get ready, uh, so you don't have to wait. So many of them will have rolling admissions processes. So even if they say they have, you know, a May 1st deadline or a June 1st deadline, you could apply earlier. Okay, next slide. So, Again, it's the decisions you're applying through the grad school. You're going to the grad school webpage and there's an online application there, but the application you're writing is going directly to your department. That's the first stop. And it's all decided by departments, uh, by the programs, who is going to be admitted to the program. So although it looks like you're going through, through the grad school, it's not the grad school that's deciding, it's the program. So you wanna be connected with the program advisor for the program you are interested in to learn more. And indeed asking them a question helps them realize that you're interested, especially in the smaller programs. Some programs have 500 applicants, so they may not have as much time, but some of the smaller programs, uh, they're really eager to connect and find out if you're the right person. Um, so uh, I encourage you to be contacting the program advisors. 
And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, well, Susan, you are the question whisperer because you loaded up the chat. So oh, good. good job. And I'll fire these off and you guys can, that was an outstanding presentation. We'll also maybe put these links in the chat while we go along. Maybe a link and grab those or something and put them in the chat. But either way, so we have a bunch. So I'll just start at the top. Is the um, uh, UHUG alumni GRE waiver based on the last 60 credit hours or cumulative GPA? It would be the cumulative GPA. Cumulative GPA. Okay, that's a very straightforward question. I tried to pick the straightforward. There's <laughs> a lot, a lot of discussion questions right off the bat. Um, do you recommend getting in touch with the professors in your master's program? Uh, excuse me. Before applying, or how would and how would you get in touch with them? What would be the best way? Who wants to take that one? Well, I guess I would. As a professor, I'm always happy, especially with our alumni, if they're reaching out, I'm always happy to answer questions. Again, we have it. We, usually there's a, a graduate advisor who can answer um, more nuts and bolts questions about how does the program work, uh, which not every professor may know exactly um, the answers. But if there's a particular person you want to work with, um, and it's sure, I think it's not a bad idea to reach out. And some will say, go talk to the advisor and someone will want to talk with you. <laughs> so, exactly. It may depend on the size of the program right. too. This was a good question. What distinguishes the professional master's degree from a master's degree? One of the very beginning slides. So Sarah, that might've been the Sure, yours. sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, I would say generally the most of the professional master's degrees will lead to some licensure or will prepare you for licensure. So for example, um, the Masters of Social Work um, will prepare you to be a social worker and, and to be licensed. We have uh, a number of other programs that do that as well. That's not exclusively, but, but that tends to be the, the differentiation between the professional masters and the um, Master of Arts or Master of Science. But um, there, there's definitely some crossover as well in terms of you might get a master's in um, clin uh, uh, psychology and you might, counseling psychology, for example, and you might have a licensing associated with that. So, um, but that's typically the, the difference between the professional masters. It has a direct link to some sort of licensure or professional activity. Excellent. Here's one of those cut and dry answers. How long is the application waiver valid? Did we talk about that? Is that the one that's for you? Sure, we mentioned uh, that will be good for about it for a year. So okay. through applications in spring 22. So here's one of those. We had a similar question we were talking about career development back in one of our other webinars about the length of your resume, right? There's, this question is about the length of your personal statement. Should you be max one page or is it okay to go over onto a second page in your personal statement in your application? Well, often this, the, if you look at the, the requirements of your program, they may tell you. I mean, and usually I'd say it's, they're usually one or two pages. They don't, they don't want more. Some of them will want a, a writing sample as well, especially some of the more research oriented um, may want a paper or if you've been not professional, they might want some professional product that you've been doing. So it may not, you may be putting up some longer document as well. Um, but yeah, usually two pages is, is enough to give them like, a, fla like a flavor. I say, I'm, I'm like the simple man. I, I don't know if it's about the content or the, can you follow instructions? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I think if people who only do one paragraph, it looks a little skinny. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, I think you answered this, Susan, but just for clarification, the application fee waiver is for domestic students or not international? Does international students qualify for that as well? I didn't hear that. It domestic domestic yeah domestic yeah okay um let's see here do you recommend getting into oh i'm sorry i already, already read that one i i thought myself here for a second what if you graduated 20 years ago and have been a stay-at-home mother for 17 years what do you put on your cv <laughs> well which program are you applying for would be part of my question i mean some okay. some places are going to care more than others um and but I would put on the CV things that are relevant. You know, again, if you're trying to go to, to get the MBA, that might be different than if you're trying to go to social work, than if you're trying to go to the sociology uh, for, for research. Um, Susan, but, I could see you right there. Would you like to 
unmute and tell us what you're thinking about studying. Since I could see Buddy Not me, Susan. Susan you. Castano. Okay. <laughs> I see Buddy the Elf behind you, so I know you have a great personality. So I know you'll come on and talk to us. Go ahead. A ask your question. Um, okay. So I'm applying or I'm wanting to apply to the um, education department for a master's of education in counseling and mental health. Great. Um, my undergrad is in communication disorders, but then we moved out of the country. And when we came back, I was in my thirties and, you know, mm -hmm. and then kids happened. So. Which is uh, the hardest gig going, by the way, raising actually, kids. Yes. So like that, that's about. what buddy's for. Um, <laughs> I have two teens and we're not doing elf on the shelf anymore. We're doing buddy oh, scaring buddy. in the morning. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. So you're thinking about going back and getting an, a, 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 a graduate degree in, in education somewhere. Um, in counseling. counseling. Well, first, let me say you're very typical. Oh, okay. That's good. So many graduate students, I mean, some come right from, from undergraduate, but many come back in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s. Um, it's, it, you know, the, our programs range in age and, and experience, and which makes them great fun to, to be part of because they're very that's another part of the diversity is age diversity um, but you're not the only one um, and so you don't have to be defensive about it you still again you have to explain as i say explain going forward what it's for because i really do think that you want these these statements of purpose to be forward looking how is this going to fit with what i want to do next excellent um, we did have a question about how the waiver would be sent. We're going to send the information for tonight's participants in your follow-up email about the waiver. Okay, so when you when you, we send the information about thank you for attending tonight's webinar, we'll have the information in there about your waiver. Okay, I know someone had asked that. So we'll make sure that's available. Um, let's see, Greg is asking, are there any aid incentive programs available specifically for UH staff, current UH staff? <clears throat> Sarah, you want to get that or you want me to get that? Um, I think there is, but I'm not, I'm not sure of the details of the um, so there is program a staff, for staff. There's yeah. a staff scholarship program okay. that, that every spring there's an application for that. Um, and there's no, there's no lower tuition for staff or for faculty. It's the same yeah, tuition. There is a, and you are eligible to take a certain number of, I believe you can take a certain number of classes per semester, something like that. There is a, it's not a waiver, but you're right. It's a scholarship program that you can apply for that they will, I think it's three hours a semester or something like that. So check on the uh, under pass. If you're a staff member, you have it, right? So you can go into the HR uh, page. I can help you with this one because I looked it up. Uh, the HR page, there is some information there under uh, benefits. Go to the benefits page and it will tell you about uh, how many hours a semester you can try to apply for aid as a faculty staff member. Okay. Um, what should be included in the purpose statement? Uh, Farzan is asking that. Is Farzan on that wants to ask the question? Oh, first off, I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan. I don't know if Farzan is a Philadelphia Eagles fan or not, but that immediately makes me my friend on this we can commiserate about how bad our team is. He might not be a Philadelphia Eagles fan, but he's asking, he or she is asking, uh, what should be included in the purpose statement? Can I include the reasons for our low grades and the issues that he had, he or she had? Sarah, do you want to try this? Sure, I would say absolutely. Um, you want your um, personal statement to really reflect on what is your motivation for wanting to go to graduate school uh, or to apply to that particular program. I think it's also important if there were, um, you know, some factors that contributed to low grades or some personal circumstances around that that you want to uh, explain, that's your opportunity to do that. Um, certainly, you know, when we review applications, there are, you know, situations that impact students' grades that may, you know, maybe a student had one bad semester because of some personal uh, things going on in their life or, um, and I, I, think, I think it's a good opportunity to um, explain that. Susan, what's your perspective? I know you probably review more applications. Than yeah, I, I would, I mean, for sure, um, I guess I had two strategies. I mean, one is you're, again, you're not the only one who's had a bad, who's had a, 
uh, F or something on, you know, a lot of people change, come into uh, undergrad, think they're going to be pre-med and, and bomb their chemistry courses. Sarah, I'm sorry about that, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, and then they, they decide that there's something else they really want to do. So that lowers your GPA, but people are looking, you know, people who start looking at your applications um, will see that you're not applying for chemistry, you're applying for an art history course. And they'll say, and they probably won't care that you've got an F in chemistry. They may, probably they got an F in chemistry themselves. So they may, they may like that. So again, you're not the only one who's had something, there may be something to explain. Also, if you have done well, if you're coming recently from UH and you have a professor who's gonna write you a letter of recommendation, possibly they can write that, um, you know, that I know that so-and-so didn't do so well in their first couple of years, but was a, you know, the best student. Um, once, once they got here and figured out what they were doing, they were the best student. So sometimes other people can be your advocates or do the explaining for you. Mm -hmm. you, graduated, so you graduated, so how bad can it be, right? You, you graduated, so that's, you, you had a win there somewhere, right? <laughs> Well, and I think another way to look at it, Susan, that's a good point that, you know, you're, you're not the only one. And sometimes providing some context allows you to tell your story rather than just having your reviewer wonder why that happened or, you know, why there's that one bad grade or those two bad grades or that bad semester or something like that. Um, you know, it really gives you an opportunity to put it into perspective for whoever's reviewing your application rather than letting them imagine what it, what it might, might have been. But also people love turnaround stories. So if you did a, if you had a bad freshman year and then you turned around and, and by senior year, you're getting all A's. I mean, that looks great. You stuck with it and you persevered and you figured out what it is you want to do. Um, so people like that. Yep. We, when we get folks to register, they send in some questions in advance. So I have a few, but we are still taking some in the chat if you guys want to enter them. But uh, many of these are from our viewers already. So this one would be, what should I do? This is an interesting one, because this would be one that I might ask you. What should I do if the master's degree I want to pursue requires a specific bachelor's degree other than the one I currently have? Are you out of luck? So, is there a way, a way to make that happen? Sure, I think that will be dependent on the program, the particular master's program. Um, and what I mean by that is there might be programs where if your undergraduate degree is not in that area but is in a related area you can just go on to the graduate program you know um, but there might be other ones where you need to first go back and take some undergraduate coursework um, you know probably um, you know a good example might be if you want to go to here susan I'll, I'll bring in chemistry again if you want to go to medical school you have to have taken chemistry and biology and and um, uh, a number of science courses and if you haven't taken those you have to go back and take those before you can before you can apply um, but you don't have to have majored in chemistry for example so if you majored in English but you went on and took the those basic chemistry courses that you needed for for the math for the doctorate you could go ahead and apply so so there's really I think you have to pay look at what the requirements are maybe reach out and say you know my undergraduate degree is in um, X, I'm interested in your program. What would I need to do to be, you know, a, a competitive applicant for the program? Are, so I'd are, say that even like a program like communications disorders, they have what they call leveling courses. Um, they, they routinely accept people who haven't taken some basic courses they need to take as an undergraduate. Um, and so they are admitted uh, so provisionally on based on they complete all these courses that they have so so that's again it's not unheard of that people switch or need some extra courses so there's probably if there's a specific courses that are required you're probably not the only one who hasn't taken all of them and they may have a route a somehow pipeline that says here this is how you take these courses maybe as a post-baccalaureate uh, and then you uh, get in uh, do sufficiently well in them and you can be admitted. What, what, what is the benefit uh, or the difference between a thesis and a non-thesis program? So um, a thesis program will require some, um, will require that you write a thesis and so that will involve some sort of 
uh, research or research project that you'll work on. And so the thesis, or if it's a, if it's a master's or the dissertation, if it's a PhD, um, you know, really the scope of the project, I think, would be the difference in those two cases. So in a PhD, you might work for a couple of several years on your, on your, th on your dissertation. Um, for the master's thesis, it might be one or two semesters that you would, that you would work on that. Um, research project. And, and this next question could be six one way, half dozen another. Is there a best way to go into grad school immediately after you graduate from your undergrad or take two years off in between or everyone's just as successful or unsuccessful, doesn't matter, it depends on the individual. This is like a, a tough softball, like you can get out of this really easy. So the answer, of course, is it depends. <laughs> there, see? Yeah. The but, it depends. But I'll, let me tell you some things it depends on and see what Sarah thinks. So I, one would be some programs, I think if they're very um, research oriented and you've got some, and you've got some momentum up, you know, you don't want to take too, too much time off because it's hard to get back into uh, the, the academic world. Uh, and especially if you're thinking of a five-year PhD program, well, those get harder as you as your personal life gets more complicated. And, you know, you have more things to do. So there's some advantages to getting momentum in those. Um, so, uh, but of course, we have plenty of people who come to PhD programs 10 years after they took their BA, so it's, I mean, you know, it's definitely, there are other ways to do it. Um, there are some seems programs like, like an MBA. Susan, seems like you and I are consistently sitting in a graduation ceremony with someone who's 81 years old and just completed their master's, just right? So just completed their, or sometimes their PhD, yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, but but for, there's some programs that are very experiential. I think of Master of Public Administration or um, an MBA. They may, may really want you to have a work experience. Um, because it's not going to, the courses aren't going to make sense unless you've had some experience in that particular field. So that's what I would say it depends on. Okay. What about you, Sarah? I agree. I think that's absolutely right that it, it um, there are some programs where it is required that you have some, uh, some, ex some professional experience or it, it's actually required or strongly recommended that you have that experience before going into the program. So I think it, it comes back to the question of, you know, really researching the specific program that you're interested in and, and looking at what the requirements are for um, admission. I guess the other like thing I'd say, no, I'm going to interrupt you, Mike, sorry. No, go ahead. I do it to you all the time. <laughs> so, so, but the other thing I'd say is, all these graduate programs, you get more out of them if you know why you're going. I mean, you have to, if you're just sort of, if you're going to grad school after undergrad because you don't know what to do next, you're not going to get as much out of it. Um, so, of course, you can you enter programs. I mean, I, I chose between political science school and law school. I didn't know exactly which one I wanted, but I turned out political science school was cheaper. So I thought, well, I might as well start there. If I'm gonna, if I can then drop out of that and go to law school if I don't like it, but the, which way is which way is the better odds? So there's, I mean, there's lots of ways to make these decisions, um, but for sure you're gonna get if you know exactly which degree you're going for, you're gonna know which professors you want to study with if you really have a, a clear path of where it's leading you. Um, so we had one question here that's interesting because I thought I thought I heard her remedy a remedy for this a while back. So. Ishiaka, I hope I pronounced that right, is asking, is it, is it possible to retake courses that you may, that may lower your chances of getting admitted? Like if you had a C in a course five years ago, can you retake that and does the course get replaced or does it just, can you do that? Can you retake courses? Um, and will it increase your chances of getting admitted? Let's just say, let's pick on chemistry. Right, you really want to do this. You took chemistry when you were undergrad, and you got a C minus. Right, and you feel like your chances will be better to take it again, and you get an A. Will that obviously sure. increase your chances? Sure. Does it replace the other one, or do you just it just makes the other one better? So it would depend. I would say that if you take the course, so if we're talking about an undergraduate course that you're going to retake, so let's say it's chemistry, since we're, since we're all happy picking on chemistry, chemistry um, you're going to retake, uh, let's say, organic chemistry. That's even better. You're going to retake organic chemistry as a, if you take it as a non-degree post-baccalaureate student, 
Um, I don't think it would replace the grade because you've already completed your degree and you're completing it as a non-degree, but it would be something you could point to in your, in your statement and say, you know, I've retaken the course and, and you know, got an A. Um, and, and so clearly I, I understand this material or, or I've done this. So that, that would be my suggestion for that. Now, if instead you were enrolled as a graduate student, so let's say you applied to the chemistry PhD program and they said, well, first we want you to take this organic chemistry as a leveling course. Then if you take the organic chemistry, even though it's an undergraduate course and you're a graduate student, it does count in your graduate GPA because you're enrolled as a graduate student while you take it. So it really depends when, when you take it. If you take it as part of your graduate program, it would be in consultation with your, you know, with your advisor and whether that's in your, in your best interest. And usually it would, I think rather than be a replacement, it would be a, a considered a leveling course. So in other words, replacing some of the background that you didn't get as an undergraduate so and and so i'm going to go for the trifecta the three for three it depends here comes the um, for the three for three it depends answer because there's 150 graduate programs out there um are the lecture times for professional online programs uh, set or is it self-paced um, three for three I, instead I, of it depends <laughs> it depends. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so I think, you know, we're seeing more and more uh, variations in course modes right now, right, because of the pandemic. And so we'll see what happens, right? We've shifted all the way over here where most everything is online or can switch to online. Um, very quickly. And we'll see once once we get past this pandemic where where we'll be. Um, I imagine that we'll, we'll, of course, go back to having uh, more face to face, but there may still be more opportunities for flexibility um, in coursework. So there are certain programs that design their curriculum for a working professional. And so the courses are in the evening. Uh, for example, there are other uh, programs that are are hybrid and may have weekend classes because that's when their um, students are available. Uh, so it, it really does depend. Um, uh, all kidding aside, on on kind of the program and the and and the the students that um, a lot of times the students that that program is is designed for. So if it's designed for a working professional. Um, there'll be a lot of flexibility. Now, that being said, I would say there are a lot of graduate programs and graduate courses that are in uh, late afternoon, early evening. And um, part of that has to do with the fact that sometimes our students are, are, are also involved in teaching, um, whether they're um, teachers in the school system or they're teaching for us as um, graduate assistants. So, um, yeah, so I think I can't can't really say that there's complete flexibility, but but there are some places where there is flexibility. Susan, in a related your... in a related question, I'm sorry, in a related question, uh, the difference between an EMBA and an MBA in three sentences or less is it just time? Um, EMBA or... and an MBA. So there's the f I I'll probably have to defer that to the College of Business. I know there's the executive MBA program, mm -hmm. and then there's the kind of regular full-time daytime MBA program. So I would think the executive program has more flexibility because the idea is that you're still working while you're taking right. that, whereas the full-time MBA program, you are um, committed to that program as a full-time right. student. So it's essentially a time it probably just takes you a little bit longer in the EM. Right. The yeah, you'd have to look at the web page, but I think they give you a little credit for your experience in the executive MBA. Uh, and right. I think the executive MBA really wants you to have that work yeah. experience right. before you apply for it. But. Wonderful. Well, this has been fantastic, ladies. Susan, I'm a, Sarah, we've probably been in a commencement ceremony and I just didn't know it, but Susan and I go to commencement. I get to see us in our little funny outfits with our little funny hats and Walking we're, down the, we're looking forward to the okay. next one. Yeah, I know we're looking forward to the next one. I know this one's virtual, but we'll all be back at it soon enough. And I hope everyone here on the screen and, and you'll pass the word. Those of us who are watching the recording later on, we'll take this incredibly invaluable uh, information that you've given us and, and think about graduate school at the university. And we'll see some of you at graduation ceremonies, future yep, graduation we'll be, ceremonies. Yep, we'll be a few of those. I have a few of those coming up. Who knows? You never know what the the good Lord has intended for me. We might be signing up for something as well. But I want to thank both of you for your time. 
and your efforts on behalf of our students and our alumni and for coming tonight and giving us your expertise as part of our webinar series. We really, really appreciate it. So thank you both. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. Um, and as for the rest of you that are joining us tonight, you can uh, still give us your suggestions and you will be receiving information on a survey uh, via email after this and you'll be receiving the information on your waiver uh, because you participated today. You'll get that in email afterwards. So I appreciate all of you staying on. Appreciate your participation. I wanna thank Elaine Duke from our team and Carolyn Hartman and Kristen Spike for joining us from our team for making this a wonderful uh, webinar today. And on behalf of everybody at the University of Houston, we wanna wish you all a safe, be well, be safe, and have a wonderful holiday season. And as we always end, go Cougs. Go Cougs. Good night. Go Cougs.